waters hide a ruthless yet sophisticated killer. So dangerous, even crocodiles are scared. In Africa, it has a reputation for killing more people than any other animal. That's an incredibly violent and gory death. People have the sense that they're just big, gray, dumb cows or pigs. They communicate like dolphins and bite with more force than a bull shark. The hippo went berserk, his huge tusks tearing into my torso as he drove me underwater. Scientists thought they were studying a strict vegetarian. One bite from a hippo is all that it takes. Now they're waking up to an astonishing fact. These three-ton lawnmowers are also deadly predators. All kinds of animals inspire our nightmares, but surely not these ones. Hippos have a jolly, roly-poly image. They make very popular children's toys. Yet in real life, these caricatured creatures aren't so cuddly. They're responsible for a staggering amount of death and destruction across Africa. It's not just the popular image that's wrong either. For years, hippos have also been misunderstood by scientists, who always thought they were vegetarians. Sweet dreams for some, perhaps, but for many, these animals are a waking nightmare. The mighty Zambezi is Africa's fourth largest river. It's a dramatic and powerful waterway, full of surprises. And the setting for a terrifying real-life drama that turns the spotlight on an animal with some dark and surprising secrets. I remember waking up on the morning of Saturday, March the 9th, 1996. I was quite excited and a little nervous too. River guide Paul Templer is booked to lead a small group of tourists on a nut market cruise. Okay, first, As always, uh, he kicks uh, off with the obligatory the safety cover. talk. In the safety briefing, I'm not uh, trying to put you off your experience. Top of the danger list is sunburn. Okay. Very hot sun here in Africa, and uh, make sure you've got lots of sun lotion. Yeah. Next, a warning about crocodiles. Today, no dragging your fingers in the water or any other extremities for that matter, um, as you don't want them bitten off. Last but not least, there were the hippos. Now, uh, the hippo is not targeting you specifically because you're French or German. Um, he's after the boat. Yeah. It's a very wobbly ride. So far, so good. As the group sets off, no one is seriously expecting trouble. It's a relaxing paddle down river and a chance to get close to some African wildlife. Paul is in the lead canoe. Followed closely by his old friend and fellow guide, Mike McNamara. We drifted off down while the clients opened the cooler boxes and had some gin and tonic and some wine. And I just pulled in my kayak next to Paul and we had a long chat because I hadn't seen him for a few days. As Mike and Paul chat, the four boats continue on their lazy journey downstream. Before long, the quiet backwater opens into a wider channel, and it's here that the tourists catch their first glimpse of hippos, their huge heads barely visible above the surface. Despite their size, surprisingly little is known about these animals, though in the last decade, scientists have been making some remarkable discoveries. As far as the tourists are aware, there's nothing to fear, so long as they keep their distance. 
but for Paul and the other guides, it isn't quite that simple. Mac and I discussed how there was a rogue male who had been chasing canoes recently. Both Sid and I had been chased by a, a big bull in the one section. This bull had been chasing quite a few people, so Paul asked me where it was and I explained to him. So he said we'd avoid that section. <laughs> Hoping to bypass the rogue bull, Paul picks a route that gives the hippos a wide berth. But there's an unwelcome surprise. As we were getting to the section where that bull had been, we saw a, a cow with a calf. Rogue males are aggressive, but so are mother hippos in defense of their young. Now that's a situation one wanted to avoid at all costs. One didn't want to get anywhere near the mother as she would be fiercely protective. So we went even further around. Safely past the mother hippo, Paul turns back to check that everyone's okay. Sure enough, Ben was right behind me with Mac paddling alongside him. In the fourth canoe, river guide Evans Namasango brings up the rear. Evans was lagging back a bit, so Paul stopped to wait for him. So to give him a chance to catch up, I set my paddle down and we just drifted. The scenery there was spectacular. As we floated down the narrow jungle line channel, just ahead of us, the mist rose above Victoria Falls. We all took a moment just to relax and to soak in the peace and the tranquility. The afternoon of getting close to nature is about to become too close for comfort. The tourists can't see what's attacking them. But for Paul and his fellow guides, it's already a question of survival. They know this is a hippo attack, a nightmare come true. What kind of animals are hippos? The surprising answer is that we're only just starting to find out. Rebecca Lewison is one of the few people who studies them in their natural habitat. People have the sense that they're just big, gray, dumb cows or pigs, and uh, I think they have a lot, you know, we just, we know already that they have so many adaptations that make them unique. They seem to live in family groups led by a dominant female, much like elephants, except there's a resident male in charge of each group. This is a long-lived animal, 30 to 40 years. Of course, they must have a repertoire of behaviors that allow them to live and flourish for those many years. But discovering what hippos are really up to is a huge challenge, not least because they spend up to 80% of their time in the water. To uncover their private lives, we need to know what's happening under the surface. In 1987, hippo scientist Bill Barklow made a remarkable discovery, simply by listening. The first day was just the most remarkable thing. I, I put those headphones on, I put that hydrophone in the water, and there were these sounds I'd never heard before, and I'm quite certain no one else has ever heard before. Bill's hydrophone was picking up an extraordinary volume of hippo chat a cacophony of underwater sounds. We now know from hundreds of hours of sound recordings coupled with video footage that hippos are exchanging a rich variety of greetings and information. Underwater, they make clicks. Some of the clicks are typical sort of things, but others are like they're blowing out their nose maybe, but there's no air coming out.
As far as we know, the only other animals that make clicks like this underwater are dolphins and whales. Is this pure coincidence? Or is there a connection? One of the most exciting things that's happened in evolutionary biology in terms of who's related to whom over the last decade or even longer has been the reassessment of the position of whales in the phylogeny, that's called sort of the branching tree of life in mammals. By comparing DNA, scientists have established that dolphins and whales are closely related to hippos and probably evolved from a hippo-like ancestor. The social behavior of whales and dolphins, particularly dolphins, is very complex. Dolphins appear to experience emotions such as grief and rage. And on the darker side, they even coordinate attacks on other animals. Does this mean that hippos, close relatives of dolphins, are likely to be more sophisticated than we thought? Could they too have feelings such as affection or spite? In 1996, wildlife filmmakers recorded remarkable images that seemed to show hippos grieving. Just as with elephants, the hippos linger for several hours beside the body of their dead companion, even defending the carcass against predators. Are these hippos mourning their dead? What I've seen is curiosity and interest. I don't actually know that it's mourning, but again, we don't really know that much about hippo relations. In fact, there's an awful lot we don't understand about hippo society. What else has science got wrong? To the casual observer, hippos seem laid back. Yet in water, as well as on land, they often come to blows, especially the big males. There are battles going on all of the time between the hippos. There's a lot of aggression in hippo society. Hippos are aggressive probably because of the importance of dominance in their social relationships. Dominant males can secure a territory and with it, mating rights to any resident females. Well, we think that maybe only 10% of hippo males ever mate. They're just spending all of their lives upset and trying to get a chance to mate, but that one big alpha male who's holding that territory gets all the mating. With the stakes so high, battles are often ferocious. And if two males are evenly matched for size, a serious fight erupts. Sheer size is a formidable weapon. A male hippo can grow to four and a half meters long and weigh in at three tons. This fighting machine has the largest gape of any land animal. Its jaws open more than a meter wide. Armed with massive tusks up to 70 centimeters long, they slash wildly at each other. The upper and lower canines rub together when the hippo opens its mouth, keeping them razor sharp. Hippo teeth are made of the hardest ivory in the world, tougher than that of either elephants or whales, and reputed to deflect bullets, causing sparks to fly. Male hippos are highly aggressive and will fight to the death. But there are times of the year when they're especially bad-tempered. In the wet season, hippos are able to keep cool and comfortable in deep pools of water. Their surprisingly delicate skin is actually very sensitive to the sun. Hippos live side by side with crocodiles, 
and for the most part, seem to tolerate them. But as the dry season starts to bite, the shrinking wallows become a scene of primeval violence. With the grass also disappearing fast, the hippos are left with little to eat. Other grazers move on in search of water and fresh pasture, but hippos remain in their territories. As times get more desperate, hippos display some surprising behavior. Herbivores have a complex digestive system and need a lot of time to break down large quantities of vegetation. They're not designed to hunt and eat meat. Antelopes and other grazers lack the aggression and predatory cunning needed to secure a kill. In 1995, biologist Joseph Dudley was shocked to witness hippos behaving in a way that would change how science viewed these animals forever. It's long been known that hippos kill other animals, uh, humans and other animals. It has never been reported uh, scientifically that hippos ever ate anything that they had killed. That was until one night in July 1995. One of my team members ran up and said, oh heavens, uh, the hippos have killed an impala, and come, come quickly. The hippo had taken one of the animal's legs in its mouth and was chewing it. And this individual was no maverick. Soon the rest of the pod were joining in. For hippos to actually eat another animal was absolutely astounding, absolutely unprecedented, as it turned out. Uh, never before reported in scientific history. Since this discovery, more hippo meat-eating has come to light. Some years ago, I was watching a TV special when suddenly, in the foreground of this picture, a hippo walks up to a buffalo carcass and starts cropping, feeding. I was enthralled to see this hippo eating a buffalo right in front of my face. As the dry season continues and the grass dries up, hippos seem to switch to an omnivorous diet. Perhaps hippos should be reclassified. I saw it as extremely important because to me it meant that, that hippos were not a, a pure herbivore, as everyone had always assumed but that the, they, they were actually uh, an omnivore. That hippos hunt and eat other animals is a major scientific discovery. These animals are redefining the food chain. At first glance, hippos are classic herbivores. They're big animals that graze large quantities of food. But unlike herbivores, hippos can and do make capable predators. Hippos are the largest living land animals that consume meat. And they don't just eat other animals. Just this past year, I learned that, that actually that the son of a, of a colleague and friend of mine had actually seen hippos eating another hippo in uh, Tanzania. If hippos can be cannibals, are they really mourning their dead? What may have been going on was not mourning, but, uh, but dining. Hippos, it seems, are far darker and more complex than anyone had expected. Their aggression is triggered by a shortage of food, water and mates. And they're violently territorial. Hippos would kill or try to kill, chomp on, anything that gets anywhere near them in the water. 
So if a canoe comes down a river, they'll attack that canoe within 10 or 20 feet of them. And their jaws are capable of snapping a canoe in half in one bite. And anyone in the canoe is going to go into the water, and then they tend to chase the bodies in the water. And one bite from a hippo is all that it takes. Incredibly violent and gory death. Uh, I've got stories that I don't even want to think about, much less talk about, of people being chomped up by hippos. Instead of avoiding the rogue bull as he'd intended, Paul has unwittingly steered his party right into the heart of its territory. The next thing we just heard the thump as Evans's canoe was hit from below. I turned just in time to see Evans flying through the air before he splashed into the river. I turned around over my shoulder and just saw the whole back of the canoe come up and Evans come flying out of it. My mind sprung into crisis mode. Oh no, not that, to the back, get to the back! Paul shouted to Ben to get the other clients to shore. Ben, get everyone to the rocks. Paddling towards Evans. Hang in there, I'm coming to get you. I turned around to see what was happening and I saw Evans get pulled down hard twice. Evans, at the back, get to the back, get to the back. I leant over to grab a hold of his outstretched hand and as our fingers almost touched. Now it's Paul's turn to face the angry bull. My world went dark and strangely quiet. This hippo just erupted out of the water right next to him, turned its head sideways and just took Paul across the chest and torso. A few very long seconds ticked by as I tried to figure out what was going on. From my waist up, I was not dry. But I wasn't wet either, not like my legs were. I was head first, up to my waist, down a hippo's throat. I pushed and I pulled and I wiggled about, all to no avail. Then the monster loosened his grip, long enough for me to escape. Ooh. Bursting to the surface and came face to face with Evans. As Paul swims to save Evans, he's hit again. I remember just looking over Paul's head and Evans came to the surface, looking very panicked, flailing his arms. And then he just seemed to roll his eyes back and give up and just sank below the water and I knew basically that he wasn't coming back up again. In a state of shock, Evans is unable to swim and drowns. Meanwhile, Paul is left fighting for his life. For me, everything was happening in slow motion. Possibly the most surreal moment in my life. Lying there at the bottom of the river, I remember looking up and I could see the different hues of green and yellow, the sunlight shimmering on the water's surface. I 
I watched my blood mingle with the water, and I wondered which would happen first, if I'd bleed to death or if I'd drown. Paul and his group are now embroiled in a life and death battle with a three-ton killer that's still down there, somewhere. If the attack seems like a random act, it's not. Hippos and people are in conflict right across Africa. On land, as well as in water. Africa's riverbanks, where villagers cultivate their crops, are the front line in an age-old battle. Living cheek by jowl, hippos and humans are in direct competition. And what that really means is that humans are encroaching on hippo habitat, and that's something that we are finding across many, many protected areas uh, across the continent. The more fields that people plant, the less grassland there is where hippos can graze. And fishermen are constantly pushing into their territorial waters. It's no wonder there's conflict. Samonga is typical of many villages that have a hippo problem. It sits on the banks of the Zambezi in Zambia. For food, the locals depend on a mixture of river fish, irrigated crops, and cattle that graze the banks. But hippos are grazers too. At night when it's cool, they come out of the water to feed. And their appetites are massive. A hippo can consume more than 40 kilos of vegetation before dawn. If it finds maize or sugarcane instead of natural pasture, so much the better. To protect their crops against marauding hippos, the villagers of Samonga keep a night vigil. At the first sign of trouble, the watchman raises the alarm. Within minutes, a mob of villagers is up in arms, driving off the intruder with spears and flaming torches. The battle with hippos isn't just being fought on land, but also on water. These local fishermen are trading hippo horror stories. Some have merely been knocked from their boats. A hippo came from nowhere and beat my boat. It nearly took my arm off when I tried to swim away. <laughs> I fell on top of a hippo when my boat flipped. I managed to escape only just. Others have been mauled and have the scars to prove it. My canoe was knocked over. I was bitten on my leg as I tried to get away. A few have even lost their lives. And it's not just people getting killed. Lately, the hippos come out at night and attack our cattle, injuring them and leaving them to die. Just about everyone, it seems, has a tale to tell. 
Like many others, former fishermen, Trustin Lovu has been severely maimed. When the hippo hit the boat, I didn't know what happened. I only felt the pain when it crushed my leg. Trust's left leg was sliced clean off, and he was almost disemboweled. Not surprisingly, he's too scared to go anywhere near the river. Every year, hippos maim and kill hundreds of people. But in one village at least, the war is finally over. Until a few years ago, Wet Chow in Ghana had a major hippo problem. It was the usual story. Trampled crops and fishing boats attacked. There were a number of communities right down on the river banks. Um, there were small fishing settlements. There was growing conflict between hippos and human settlements. Incredibly, though, the people here actually celebrate hippos. We realized that there was a special relationship between one of the key ethnic groups here and the hippopotamus. The women here sing of hippos to their children. Right from the start, the people here see hippos as their friends. Hippo legends are passed down from generation to generation. In Wala culture, these animals are considered sacred. When our village was at war, we were being attacked, and so we fled into the river. Our hippos lined up to make a living bridge, and we escaped. But when our enemies tried to cross, the hippos tipped them into the water, and they all drowned. As well as inspiring legends, Hippos are also the source of people's names. Young people, as they complete the puberty rites, and this is both boys and girls, go to the river and are given a new name from the river gods. The hippos are considered the messengers of the river gods. And so you take your new name that you carry with you for the rest of your life from puberty onwards from the hippos. Anyone who gets their name that they carry with them from the time you reach your adolescence onward is definitely going to have some kind of special relationship with whoever gave that to you. And that's the situation here. Rather than kill their problem hippos, these villagers decided to pack up and pull out. Approximately 300 fishermen and their families moved to kilometers away from the river, their main way of earning a living that's a significant sacrifice. But it's a move that's paid off. It's not just that hippos attract tourists who buy souvenirs. Simply by giving ground, these people have bought peace. Their fields are no longer plundered and fishing nets are rarely damaged. But Wet Chow's happy ending is unique. Elsewhere, hippos and people are still getting in each other's way. On the Zambezi in Southern Africa, River guide Paul Templer has lost his friend Evans to a rogue hippo and is now fighting to save himself. He's up against an animal that's turning out to be more sophisticated and more deadly than scientists ever thought. Paul managed to break free, started getting away from the hippo. The next thing I knew, the front of Mac's little red kayak appeared inches from my face, and I managed to grab a hold of the handle on the boat's nose. 
and the hippo was biting at his feet. Get your legs up! It's right behind us, get your legs up! Pick your legs up! And I managed to back paddle probably 10 or 15 meters and we came to a, a submerged rock with some grass growing off it. And I jumped out of the kayak and managed to pull Paul up onto the rock. That we made it to the rocks was something of a miracle to me. And then I made the mistake of taking a look at myself. So we pulled him up on the shore and rolled him over to have a look at his injuries, which were extensive. My one arm from the elbow up, it had been crushed to a pulp. And from the elbow down, it had been stripped of all its flesh. He had lacerations in his head, a horrible wound in his left foot where it had been written almost right through. At this point, Paul sat up um, and told me that he could feel his lungs filling with blood. I knew right away that one of the hippo's tusks must have punctured my chest cavity. The only thing I could think of to do was to get the cling wrap off the snacks that we had for the clients. And we took the cling wrap and actually covered over the wound to try and protect the integrity of the chest cavity. managed to tourniquet his ankle to stop the bleeding through the hole in his foot and tourniqueted the top of his arm because the, the injuries to his arm were still bleeding. We took a life jacket and put Paul's arm inside, strapped the life jacket around him. They've lost their radio and first aid kit in the attack. Their only option now is to get Paul out by themselves. It's a race against time, and with Paul's dead weight in his canoe, Ben paddles straight back through the middle of the angry bull's territory. He grabbed me and he said, um, I'm dying. Mac, please tell my family that I'm sorry and that I loved them. I think I told him to sort it out and tell him himself and gave him a smack and then told Ben to hurry and to get him to shore. To be honest, I really didn't think I would see him again. I thought he was going to die on the way out. had a simple boat trip gone so tragically wrong. By straying into the bull's patch of river, Paul and his group had provoked a full-blown territorial response. And this hippo didn't just attack the boats, it also went after the people. But it's not just other species that hippos deliberately kill. Sometimes they even hunt down their own kind. The ancient Egyptians feared hippos. One of their most evil gods, the bringer of destruction, the would-be slayer of goodness and light, was represented by a hippo. To them, the hippo was the embodiment of malevolence, the dark side of nature. But in complete contrast, the ancient Egyptians also recognized a good side to hippos. They noticed that hippos make superb mothers, and this side of their dual personality was revered. Mother hippos were seen as a positive force and worshipped as a god of pregnancy. In fact, the mother-infant bond in hippos is incredibly strong, as three young boys from Garawa in Cameroon discovered 12 years ago. We were paddling along the river when we spotted something in the water. So we drifted closer to investigate. Little did they know that they were about to become adoptive fathers. 
on est dans la musique, petit à petit. We were surprised to come across a very young baby hippo in the water. The mother was nowhere to be seen. We didn't know what to do, so we tried to make friends with her. They named the orphan Africa, and she bonded with them as she would have done to a hippo mother. Africa is our baby. We love her like a child. We would do anything to protect her. Twelve years on, Africa lives in a wild pod, yet is completely tame. She even lets the local children ride on her back. Africa is remarkable proof that hippos will adopt other animals as parents, even humans. Perhaps one of the reasons the mother-infant bond is so strong is that hippo calves face mortal danger from the day they are born. Crocodiles are deadly, so hippo mothers must be too. The mother of that hippo chomped a crocodile. We don't know if it's the same one, but it was a big eight, eight or nine foot one in half. It looked like intentional behavior. It looked like uh, all of the things I try to avoid as a professional biologist, anthropomorphism, like vengeance and all of that. But it certainly had that, that feel to it. That the mother was going after the killer. It's further evidence that hippos are more dangerous than expected. Not only because they're unpredictable, but because their attacks may have intent. And hippo mothers don't just have to guard against attacks by crocodiles. Hippo males have a very dark side. I was watching the hippos in the pool and I noticed this was the smallest hippo I had ever seen. It was with a large female. As the mother tends to her baby, a dominant male launches an attack. The mother loses contact with her calf. And all of a sudden, the baby swimming for its life. A large male basically just came up, grabbed the, the infant in its mouth, gave it a shake, and it, you know, within, I don't know, a few seconds it was it was over. The attack was brief, brutal, and chilling. I knew that something strange was happening. I really had no idea what to expect. It definitely took me off guard. Mother doesn't give up hope until eventually hunger drives her away from the corpse. What 
what I was really interested in knowing is was this just a one-off strange event or how prevalent is hippo infanticides? And so what I found starting from about uh, 1930s onward was that there were at least eight accounts of hippo infanticide that were eyewitness accounts. So what I was able to put together was circumstantial evidence to support the fact that this seemed to be a similar story as we see with lions, that this was a, a territory takeover, a new male who wanted to gain access to this female. Like lions and gorillas, when a new male takes over a group of hippos, he sometimes kills the newborn. He may do this to bring the females into season sooner so that he can mate and they will bear his young. Hippos kill for a variety of reasons, to mate more quickly, sometimes for food, and often in defense of territory. Unfortunately for Paul, he's now experiencing the force of this nature firsthand. One arm's hanging by a thread and his lung is punctured. He's fighting for his life. So we made it to the bank and fortunately for me, there was a medical air rescue team who were on exercise nearby. That the medical rescue team were practicing maneuvers on the bank was an incredible stroke of luck in an otherwise very bad day. Because of all my head, neck and spinal injuries, they hadn't been able to give me any painkillers. Let me tell you, that made for one heck of a road trip. They wheeled me into the operating room and left me there beneath this bright overhead spotlight. I couldn't see anyone, but I knew that they were there. I could hear them discussing how amazing it was that anyone could survive what I'd been through. I heard things like, oh, his foot's horrible. Those arms are barely still attached. He's definitely gonna lose a limb or two. So I'm laying there and I can hear all this talk about bits and pieces coming off and I can feel myself starting to panic again. The last thing I remember was the priest barging in to administer last rites. Hippos are proving to be full of dark surprises. Not only are they capable predators, they can be cannibals too. And when it suits them, they'll even kill another hippo's baby. Paul Templer, though maimed for life, is lucky to have survived his bloody encounter with a hippo. Today, he travels around the world using his incredible experience to motivate and encourage people to change their lives for the better. We don't know how many people are killed each year by hippos, since many deaths probably go unreported. But by some estimates, they kill more people in Africa than any other large animal. Hippos are certainly proving to be more complex and more dangerous than scientists had imagined. And as humans encroach ever more into hippo territory, they'll inevitably pay the price of the darker side of hippos.